Tá tudo safe aqui, cara. Beleza. So thank you everyone. Uh, so we are gonna start our uh, last lecture for this morning. So the last lecture is going to be by Nicola Mazzari and he's going to introduce um, Vanier functions. So please Nicola. Great, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks uh, to Feliciano and everyone for the invitation. Uh, always happy to be uh, in Austin. Uh, are you all awake? Uh, how is it going? Uh, Great. Um, so uh, what I wanted uh, to is really giving you an uh, uh, overall perspective on this uh, uh, subfield uh, of uh, maximally localized uh, Vanier functions, uh, the theory, the algorithms, uh, the applications. Uh, but before starting, uh, since uh, you know, Paolo already presented, let's say, density functional theory, um, I wanted to give you my uh, personal history of uh, density functional practice uh, and the electronic structure, uh, how it evolved uh, in the years, uh, say, before uh, the development, in our case, of these uh, techniques of uh, maximally localized Vanier functions. So, so just to you know, remember a few dates, uh, 1964 and 1965, uh, Doenberg and Kohn and the kohn Shama papers, uh, uh, that were uh, you know, very fascinating, but uh, very few people consider them uh, useful or uh, somehow uh, Kohn and Shama were, uh, you know, serendipitous lucky in uh, sort of finding out uh, the local density approximation as something that uh, a posteriori we learned uh, would respect, uh, you know, important uh, some rules, but uh, it wasn't seen at the six, during the 60s as a, a practical uh, theory, actually, for doing electronic structure calculation. Uh, during the 70s, there were more exploration, but I would say, you know, some of the milestones uh, uh, really, this uh, 1979 paper by Jason Him, Alex Zunger, and Marvin Cohen, uh, writing out uh, the formalism of what we call, you know, the model, the modern uh, total energy pseudo-potential plane wave method, uh, uh, using indeed the plane wave as a basis set, uh, and then uh, in and Cohen, uh, you see showing uh, in uh, 1980 that you could actually predict uh, the equation of state in silicon in all its different phases. So you could find that the uh, equilibrium parameter of silicon, the bulk modulus uh, with the Maxwell construction and the common tangent, uh, the transition pressure to beta T. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, if you see this figure in 1980, um, everything else that we have done for the past uh, 44 years, uh, it's almost self-evident. You know, this is the first time one could actually calculate the properties of solids uh, from first principles, and uh, we just uh, kept doing, uh, I would say, a refinement uh, uh, on top uh, of this. In particular, some of the key developments in the 1980s was the development uh, by Hamann Schluter et Chang of the idea of non-conserving pseudopotentials that were transferable, so they could uh, represent well the scattering of electrons at uh, uh, various energies, and Bachelet, Hamann Schluter developing pseudo-potential for the entire periodic table. So one could do materials calculations, uh, one could do molecular dynamics uh, uh, with density functional theory forces, uh, thanks to the Carparinello extended Lagrangian, and uh, one could do perturbation theory uh, uh, with uh, linear response uh, techniques and the development of uh, density functional perturbation theory. So this is the 80s, really, uh, you know, applications uh, to materials uh, uh, become uh, present uh, and common, and uh, you know the uh, you know this is the the architecture, the machines on which all these calculations were done. Uh, but I think something at the beginning of the nineties uh, become uh, very exciting is the second time that Paolo Giannozzi appears. You see, in nineteen ninety two, uh, there are these papers uh, that start uh, hinting at the capabilities uh, of doing uh, these predictive electronic such calculations uh, just uh, with a linear scaling cost. The traditional algorithmic approaches uh, scale as the cube uh, of the system size. So if you double your system, you become uh, eight times more expensive. So you saturate very quickly uh, the capability of computers. Uh, if you were linear scaling, you could go very quickly to much uh, larger system scales. And so in particular, in 1993, the APS March meeting was in Seattle. Uh, and there was a you know, session that was a, a little bit uh, like uh, you know, the superconducting session in 1987, 
where everyone was packed in a small room uh, discussing all these uh, uh, very recent ideas about uh, uh, electronic structure methods uh, with a linear system, um, linear size scaling. So I had uh, just started in March uh, my PhD in the UK, in Cambridge, and uh, Francesco Ma Mauri had started it uh, a few months earlier in CIS and then in Lausanne. And so he was at the March meeting, he came back, and uh, we were driving together from Cambridge to London to see Peleas and Melisande, and he was telling me about all this excitement about linear scaling. And so at a certain point, a lot of blue lights appeared and there was a policeman uh, saying in perfect you know, British English uh, that we were going at 92 miles per hour that were significantly above the speed limit. I responded in half English, half Italian, and uh, they let us go. But uh, somehow uh, the excitement was there. And so when it was a time to do a postdoc, I had somehow arm twisted uh, David Vanderbilt in offering me a position. I wanted to move uh, to the East Coast and in particular work with him. And so there was a, a call, again, you see from the uh, NSF, uh, sort of forward looking uh, about, uh, you know, sort of high performance, basically advanced uh, scientific computing. And uh, I convinced David that we should look at uh, linear scaling. And uh, I love a uh, sort of, we corresponded, uh, you see, when we were preparing uh, the proposal, David was very pleased, but he said, uh, I would lower the verbal temperature by a few degrees. So that has uh, stuck with me. We got, uh, uh, we got the grant, and so uh, I moved there, and, uh, you know, sort of, we started this work uh, that I'll explain a bit better on Vanier functions. That actually became uh, quite popular very early on. I mean, this is when uh, Walter Cohn won uh, the Nobel Prize in physics, and actually, because we had these pretty pictures, I think uh, the APS uh, used the Vanier functions in baryon titanate for their uh, for their piece. And you see, just uh, a year later, the Nobel Prize, uh, there was a SECAM. SECAM is a, uh, you know, I would say European organization, but these days uh, uh, with many nodes uh, worldwide, including, uh, say, one uh, around uh, Chicago and Argonne and the University of Northwestern and so on. And they had a uh, you see, a uh, workshop on recent developments in the theory and Vanier function and other localized electronic wave functions. Uh, uh, you can maybe spot here uh, Walter Cohn, I see here Raffaele Resta, I see here George Verzac, you see David Vanderbilt, uh, Thomas Arias, Pierino Silvestrelli, Stefan Goedeker, uh, Ivo Souza, here many others that, uh, you know, contributed a lot to this. So let's go actually in the sort of uh, practice, not of density functional theory, but of Vanier function. So block theorem, you should all know, but just as a reminder, because it's so important, you know, all the uh, translation operators uh, T for a, you know, lattice uh, translation R of our brave lattice uh, commute with the Hamiltonian because there is only the kinetic energy and the periodic potential. So the Hamiltonian uh, is uh, uh, periodic, uh, but doesn't mean that the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are periodic. The eigenstate uh, psi, uh, actually, thanks to Bloch theorem, can be written as uh, the product of a periodic part, uh, U, and uh, that is modulated uh, by this uh, plane wave uh, E to the i k dot r. Um, and uh, we use as quantum numbers uh, k, the block quasi-momentum, and we constrain that uh, to be inside uh, the first uh, Brian zone. And so we have also a band index appearing. So we identify an electron in a, in a solid uh, with a band index n uh, with a k block quasi-momentum that sits inside uh, the first Brian zone. And uh, let's say we are spin the generator in, in all of this. I won't prove it. There is a very nice proof on the Ashcroft mermaid. But so, what does it mean? Say, if we have just a one band, we have a, a one dimensional system, the Brian zone goes from minus pi over a to pi over a. So, and that's uh, in red, uh, let's say the first band. So, every point along that red band is an electronic state for the Hamiltonian. And uh, it's going to be given by a periodic part. Uh, times uh, a modulation. And so you see here the modulation in green, depending of where k is. So if there is a, a k equals zero, there is no modulation. And the uh, block uh, wave function is here in black. You see it's actually periodic. And uh, if instead there is a modulation, you see that the actual block wave function 
uh, is not really periodic, but is given by a periodic part that you can imagine uh, times uh, this uh, modulation. And so Vanier function, Vanier that actually Gregory Vanier that was originally Swiss, but he moved to the States in the thirties, uh, came out uh, with this uh, uh, conceptual suggestion of uh, building, uh, you see a unitary transformation uh, that goes uh, from uh, say quantum state uh, N and K to quantum state uh, capital R and N. So remember capital R is the Bravais lattice vector K is the block quasi momentum and is the, is the band. And the Vanier transformation is written as a, an integral over the Bruen zone uh, over K of uh, the block uh, wave function times, uh, this is a phase now, it's not a modulation. There is a capital R here. So it's not modulating anything, it's just a phase uh, where R is the uh, new, uh, if you want, uh, quantum number. So what are uh, the properties uh, of this transformation? Uh, we'll see that in a moment, uh, uh, but let me sort of highlight uh, that this is, uh, um, I would say an ill-defined transformation uh, because uh, from say the, 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 the Schrodinger equation or the equation of density functional theory, uh, we have uh, what we call the gauge freedom. That is uh, uh, at every K point, or if you want uh, every state, uh, you know, we can multiply it uh, by, a phase, uh, e to the i times uh, a number that I call here phi n uh, of k, um, that uh, will not uh, change our uh, expectation values, at least uh, in the sort of ordinary definition of uh, expectation, uh, expectation values. So in reality, we have uh, at every k point and for every band, uh, this uh, so-called uh, gauge freedom, and that will actually change uh, what we obtain as a Vanier function. Uh, is there any mathematician in the room? No, okay, so that's good because uh, uh, sometimes they feel sick when I present uh, this demonstration of uh, the, the fact that Vanier function uh, sort of are localized. And this is, uh, uh, you know, just by hand, I, uh, I'm looking at a Vanier function uh, that uh, corresponds uh, Let's say we have just one band, so there is no band index. And uh, let's sit uh, at the, let's say, home unit cell, so capital R is equal to zero. So this is the definition of the variate transformation. And if we look at this object, and in particular, we look at its values uh, at, uh, say, uh, direct Bravais lattice vector Ri, as we go towards, uh, you know, infinity very far away from our home unit cell here at zero, uh, this uh, will be the value. And you understand that, that if uh, R is very, very large, uh, as we integrate over K points, uh, these phase factors uh, uh, will oscillate as mad. And uh, if we are lucky that, you know, in general we are not, uh, but let's say if we are lucky, uh, they are going to cancel out. Uh, and so for Ri really large, uh, this omega zero of Ri uh, might actually go to, go to zero. There are much better sort of formal demonstration, but this just to give you a feeling. I wanted also to introduce a, a broader gauge freedom that we have, say, in an insulator. Suppose you have a system that have two occupied bands, one and two. And so, in principle, you know, the total energy, think at Hartree Fock or density functional theory, so in a picture of Slater determinants, uh, is going to be invariant uh, for a unitary transformation, as I've defined it here. That is, uh, we can sit uh, at every k point, uh, let's, sit, uh, let's sit here. At that k point, I have two states uh, for n equal to one and n equal to two, but I can mix them together with a unitary matrix. A unitary matrix is a bit like orthogonal matrices uh, for say a complex uh, algebra. So U, U dagger is equal to U dagger, U is equal uh, to one. And uh, if I mix uh, these uh, two states uh, with this unitary transformation, uh, I have uh, a new set of states uh, that uh, are uh, still uh, you know, going to give me the same uh, total energy if I were to calculate say the DFT total energy. And so they are still a good representation 
of my electronic ground state. And so when I look at the, say, Vanier transformation in the most general sense, not only I do this, uh, say, unitary transformation by integrating over the Brillouin zone, so it's a continuous transformation, this uh, exponential that is just a phase in decay, but uh, at every k point, uh, I can mix, uh, uh, say, all the states uh, that, uh, say, I could have, uh, let me take here the case of uh, silicon or gallium arsenide, I have uh, four valence occupied states. So at every k point, let's say a k, I can mix uh, those uh, four state uh, together. So the Vanier transformation in this general sense is a double unitary transformation at every k point with a unitary matrix U, say in this case a four by four unitary matrix, uh, um, and then I integrate uh, each one of the resulting uh, U, M, N, Psi, N, Psi, M, uh, I integrate them over the Brian zone. So the property of this transformation is that uh, because it's unitary, unitary, uh, we are spanning the same Hilbert space as our original states. Uh, but in particular, it's very easy to demonstrate that, uh, say, you know, the resulting uh, Vanier function that I write uh, either in, uh, say, ket as Rn or, uh, say, as uh, Vanier of n centered around uh, R, um, are going to be translational images of each other. That is, if I uh, substitute here for R capital R plus R prime, I will have a Vanier function that has been translated. And they're all orthogonal with respect to the band index and the Bravais lattice index. So these are, you know, uh, trivial properties always satisfied uh, by the Vanier transformation. But as I said, uh, we have this entire gauge of freedom of uh, choosing uh, at every k point uh, the four by four uh, matrices, however we want, uh, provided that they are unitary. And so we could play around, we could decide that uh, maybe we just transform the bottom band here, we transform the top three bands, we transform uh, all uh, four of them uh, with, uh, you know, either a three by three matrix for the bottom band, just a phase or a four by four uh, matrix. But uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, the choice of the U? One, you know, simple approach that had been developed and uh, applied for years uh, is uh, choosing the U by projection. So say if we have uh, uh, some localized orbital uh, G, uh, what we can uh, construct is the scalar product uh, between the Psi and the G. This per se is not a unitary matrix, but it's very easy to transform it in a unitary matrix uh, with the appropriate algebra. If this is A, you can sort of uh, show how you can make it uh, unitary. And so, what happens uh, is that if you actually look at this uh, definition, you realize right away that now this definition uh, becomes uh, invariant uh, with respect uh, to any possible unitary transformation of the Psi. Because uh, if I send uh, the Psi cat in Psi U dagger, and uh, then the Psi bra becomes uh, U Psi, and the U dagger U cancels out, uh, so now it doesn't matter what is the arbitrary mixing uh, that I get, the arbitrary phase factors and whatever, all these gauge freedom have disappeared. And so the phi n does not display any gauge freedom if I write uh, things uh, like this. And so one could say build uh, phi that one would just uh, transform with the integral in the Brillouin zone. And this uh, would give rise in some of the trials that had been done during the 80s and 90s to sort of nice uh, localized states. But um, we wanted somehow to not use this uh, projection techniques. And so what we came out uh, uh, with David, there was a very simple definition of a you know, driving force towards a localization for the U matrices. That is, uh, we defined a functional omega uh, that is nothing else uh, that, uh, you know, the sum of the, say, um, uh, uh, expectation values of R square uh, around uh, the center. So just, uh, you know, a very simple measure of localization. And we said uh, what we want is an algorithm that uh, 
is such that the unitary transformation u are driven uh, to minimize uh, this uh, very simple localization functional. There is nothing much physical in this. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, saying uh, our, uh, say, Vanier functions uh, needs to minimize uh, the square of the spread uh, around uh, their, uh, their center. It seemed fine at the time uh, when we sort of, you know, thought of this, uh, we hadn't realized that there was a huge uh, chemical uh, chemistry literature uh, um, in the 60s uh, about uh, doing this uh, for orbitals. This was uh, not really before the internet, but before journals had gone online. So finding uh, uh, references was much more difficult and neither of us uh, were uh, aware of this. And uh, we had a visitor, Doug Doren, uh, in, um, from, uh, uh, from Delaware that told us you should look at what, uh, say, Poster and Boys and Edmiston and Rudberg and Dana in the chemistry. I, I guess, uh, you know, uh, I should have listened to Doug uh, a bit more because we were sharing an office. He was coming uh, once a week. Uh, and, you know, so this was 96 and I asked him what he was doing. Uh, and uh, what he was doing is uh, he had discovered these things called neural network. Uh, and he was trying to represent uh, the energy of something uh, with a neural network. And I obviously, you know, thought that that was meaningless. And, you know, I sort of let it go with this, uh, you know, weird uh, weird idea. So pay more attention to your, to your visitor. And Doug anyhow gave us also the, the pointer. Uh, but I think uh, what happens, uh, say, if you're in a solid, uh, is quite uh, interesting. I'll explain it in a moment. But so let me focus, and these are really, you know, five important slides. Uh, let me focus on what we do when we construct uh, uh, maximally localized, as we call them, a Vanier function. So we do an ab initio calculation. So with quantum espresso or whatever, you know, code of choice these days, I think there are tens of electronic such a code that you can use that are interfaced uh, with the Vanier 90 code or with others. I mean, I think Antimo Marazzo will talk about uh, what we now call uh, the Vanier function ecosystem. So you got uh, your Psi MK and uh, what uh, you want to do is uh, perform uh, this uh, unitary transformation, at least in principle, we'll never do it in practice, uh, but we want uh, to, in particular, uh, find out, uh, and it will be an iterative uh, refinement, uh, you want to find out uh, this uh, uh, unitary matrices uh, that are such that uh, uh, your uh, resulting uh, Manier, Manier function are as localized as possible using uh, the metric uh, that we have just defined, that is they minimize uh, the localization function omega. I don't think I go much into that, but that this function is actually also a lot of local minima. So that's why uh, until recently, the practice of calculating Vanier function has required a little bit uh, of, uh, say, uh, magic uh, powder that uh, these days maybe is not uh, possible anymore. One of the cool things uh, that we discovered earlier on and that were specific to this definition of omega is that uh, we could actually decompose uh, omega into two pieces, uh, uh, an omega i piece and an omega tilde piece uh, that are obtained uh, just by uh, uh, adding and uh, subtracting, uh, say, the off diagonal term in the sense uh, that uh, uh, we add uh, also all these matrix elements uh, with Vanier functions that are translated, centered on the other unit cells and between bands. So by adding and subtracting these diagonal terms, uh, we can rewrite omegas, omega i. Uh, plus omega tilde, you see right away that omega tilde uh, is positive definite, okay? And it's very easy, I'll show it uh, in the uh, next slide, uh, that omega i is also positive definite, uh, but it's called i because it's invariant. Uh, so it's gauge invariant. So no matter what uh, the unitary transformation that you choose, uh, uh, omega i doesn't change. So minimizing... Uh, the localization functional omega uh, is equivalent uh, to minimizing uh, omega tilde, so minimizing uh, all these off-diagonal terms uh, of the position uh, of the position operator. Now, the proof of this, I'll just uh, sketch it, uh, uh, but it's very simple once you use this uh, projection operators. You use a P, that is the projection operator on the occupied uh, manifold, 
and the Q that is the complement in the Hilbert space that is, is one minus P. And so with a bit of algebra, you can actually show that the omega I uh, term can be written in this, uh, in this form. So you see it's a positive definite. There are only sort of square moduli. And uh, because it's written in the, you know, using these uh, projection operators uh, that are again uh, invariant uh, with respect uh, to the choice of the arbitrary U matrices uh, because they would cancel out here in this. Uh, so this is going to be gauge invariant. Now, so we have to minimize in principle just uh, the off diagonal terms of the position operator. Uh, but the catch is that the position operator is ill-defined in a periodic solid because uh, you can see it right away. Uh, the integral of you know, the expectation value of the position operator uh, is not uh, well-defined. Uh, the position operator is also related to the electric polarization. And you know, the time was ripe. Somehow, you know, things as you can see happen in somehow, you know, natural steps. Uh, that is, uh, uh, David Vanderbilt and Raffaele Resta uh, in the early 90s had developed uh, what these days uh, we call the modern theory of polarization in crystal. They had shown, in particular with this King Smith Vanderbilt paper, that the polarization of a macroscopic periodic solid could be written as a, a, a berry phase uh, of uh, the, say, wave function upon parallel transport. And then there was a second uh, paper by uh, David and Dominica King-Smith uh, showing that actually that berry phase polarization could be written as the sum of the uh, Vanier function centers. Uh, how was this solved? It was uh, sold, uh, I mean, one can look at it in many different ways. I mean, uh, Raffaele Rest had used, uh, you know, concepts uh, from perturbation theory to write uh, uh, this, uh, uh, these integrals in a well-behaved form. Actually, a lot of this uh, was present, is that no one reads uh, papers, not now and not at the time, but uh, was present in this uh, journal paper uh, by Blount, uh, 1962, Solid State Physics, in which uh, he showed uh, that, uh, you know, there is an alternative uh, way of uh, calculating, uh, say, the application of the position operator to a uh, Vanier functions, uh, uh, exploiting uh, this uh, so-called uh, Blount identities uh, that are valid uh, not only for the position operator, but there are uh, subsequent uh, Blount identities uh, for all the, say, n powers of the position operator. And so you could see, write it out, uh, and, uh, you know, here it's all sort of, you know, Barry's phase. Uh, the expectation value of the position operator is just an integral of the Barry, Barry connection. So topology was present, uh, you know, very early on, but uh, no one in the 60s realized, not even, you know, David and myself, uh, when uh, we wrote uh, the Vanier paper, we had, uh, you know, one appendix uh, dedicated a little bit uh, to the topological properties of Vanier functions, but I think neither of us expected how you know, relevant uh, topological properties would have become uh, in the, say, uh, late uh, part of the first decade of the 21st century. Anyhow, here we have uh, now what we need. Uh, so we can calculate, uh, you see the position operator, the center of the Vanier function, that is one component uh, of that localization functional uh, using uh, this uh, reciprocal space representation. And so what we really need uh, to calculate uh, is uh, expectation values of the gradient uh, in a reciprocal space. Uh, so UK gradient of K UK becomes very relevant. And we did uh, something very trivial in which uh, we use uh, some uh, um, you know, finite difference uh, presentation. Uh, so we wrote uh, this gradient. Uh, uh, using uh, finite uh, formulas and the math uh, maybe is not interesting uh, for, uh, for this, uh, but uh, uh, it's actually quite relevant because, uh, you know, we always do finite differences uh, in this uh, Vanier localization. And sometimes uh, the symmetry properties of the resulting Vanier functions uh, that would be exact uh, in the limit of uh, very fine discretization. So taking uh, this gradient, uh, finite difference gradients, as you see, at a point k, a certain uh, function in k plus b minus uh, f of k, 
if b goes to zero, the symmetry properties are represented. If b is finite, uh, it might be so soon. But uh, anyhow, these are, uh, you know, the building blocks uh, of the gradient. Uh, this uh, matrix elements uh, between the periodic part uh, of the block orbitals uh, for a band M at a point K and uh, the periodic part of the block orbital for uh, another band uh, N equal or different from M at a nearby K point. So at every K point, we have a little star of B vectors that are used to do the finite differences. And these B vectors uh, can be one star or they can be multiple stars and there are algorithms to determine them. And uh, with this uh, finite difference representation, uh, we can write uh, both uh, the Vanier function center, you see as uh, basically an average uh, of this imaginary part of the logarithm of the diagonal element of the overlap. And uh, we can write uh, the um, um, uh, R square, the, um, the spread of the Vanier function uh, also in terms of Mn. So this really means uh, that uh, the Vanier function localization uh, that will minimize the functional omega that is uh, really sum over R squared minus sum over R squared, uh, it can be expressed uh, all in terms uh, of these uh, matrix elements. These matrix elements can be calculated once for all. They could be calculated, say, with quantum espresso, but they can be calculated uh, with any electronic structure code of choice. So uh, in many ways, the, not in many ways, I mean, the Vanier code and the localization code is uh, oblivious of the, say, computational strategy. You know, had you used the plane waves, had you used the localized orbitals, had you used the, uh, you know, uh, linearized augmented plane waves to find your ground state and to calculate this matrix element, it doesn't care. The only thing it matters are these uh, uh, matrix elements. And as I said, you know, once we have calculated these matrix elements and we have, uh, you know, a first expression for what would be the localization functional omega or its omega tilde part, then uh, we want uh, to evolve uh, the unitary transformation. We want uh, to change them so that uh, the resulting Vanier functions becomes more and more and more and more uh, localized. And so again, uh, we just implemented a uh, uh, steepest descent or a conjugate gradient minimization of the functional omega with respect to this uh, unitary transformation. And the uh, unitary transformation can be written as uh, the exponential uh, of the imaginary part of the anti-Hermitian uh, matrix. And so we just uh, could uh, sort of have a dynamics in a, uh, um, in a world of anti-Hermitian matrix. It's a bit complicated, uh, all the algebra, but you know, so I won't go through it, but uh, conceptually we are nothing, uh, uh, we are just, uh, you know, calculating uh, uh, the derivative uh, to do the steepest descent or then to conjugate uh, this gradient uh, of the localization functional uh, with respect uh, to an infinitesimal unitary transformation. And we keep moving uh, at every K point uh, in the direction of those infinitesimal unitary transformation. You do it, uh, so it actually was very fast. I mean, it basically took place uh, in, uh, in uh, a few months. I think I joined uh, David in uh, 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 March 96. I hadn't mentioned to him that I hadn't written my PhD thesis. So when he discovered, he lost half of his hair. And then I wrote my PhD thesis very quickly. And from sort of May, we started uh, to work on this. And I think by September, October, we started having uh, some results and uh, we started writing the paper at Christmas. But basically, you know, the results uh, was that you would take uh, the four bands uh, of silicon, mix them all together, and you would get uh, four Vanier function that looks like this, uh, uh, you know, sweets, uh, basically, this uh, uh, candies uh, with, uh, you know, a covalent uh, bond uh, between two silicon atoms. I mean, now these have, uh, uh, in principle, are actually complex objects. And uh, what we were discovering is that uh, uh, basically they were always, at the end, the maximally localized Vanier function real, but they should have a sign, so blue and red have opposite sign. But, you know, this was very satisfactory from the intuitive uh, uh, physical point of view. We have uh, four Vanier function in every cell, so we have uh, four covalent bonds. If you have gallium arsenide, the arsenic 
will be, you know, electronegative, suck a little bit the covalent bond towards itself. Uh, if we had, say, amorphous silicon, we would have, uh, say, mostly distorted Vanier function, but sometimes, you know, there were Vanier functions that looked like this, that were a signature of a local environment that was, from the electronic point of view, uh, quite uh, different. And uh, what we also figured out is that uh, if we were to study a molecule uh, rather than a solid, uh, our algebra would sort of obviously translate, uh, you know, with the language of uh, isolated system in periodic boundary condition, uh, and uh, everything would go back uh, to what was called uh, the Foster Boys uh, definition of localization in molecules. That was exactly the same functional uh, that uh, you know we thought uh, we had. Uh, somehow invented and they had uh, used it uh, in the 1960s uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Cambridge, uh, UK. Uh, and also, you know, there was a long uh, sort of discussion in the chemical literature on how the Foster boys uh, uh, functional give rise uh, to, you see, these bonds uh, that the chemists, uh, are there chemists in the audience? There are some. Okay, so they are called the banana bonds and they don't like the banana bonds. And so the, actually the edmondson rudenberg criterion that uh, maximizes the electrostatic self-interaction uh, was uh, preferred from the conceptual point of view. There has not been much studies in the solid state about uh, different uh, localization criteria. Okay, but so that's uh, where we were uh, sort of, you know, at the end of 1996, uh, we had this algorithm to, you know, characterize a Vanier function applicable to periodic uh, systems, isolated molecule, disordered system, and it was just a post-processing. Uh, and the question, uh, you know, what to do, you know, next uh, with it, uh, and here I take, uh, you know, just some chapters from our review uh, in 2012 uh, with uh, Rash Mostofi, Jonathan Yates, Ivo Susan, David Vanderbilt, uh, and maybe I'll just indeed uh, show some of the more uh, uh, trivial properties, that is, uh, you know, uh, one could analyze uh, chemical bonding, uh, one could, uh, uh, you know, understand uh, the berry phase uh, polarization and the dielectric response, and those were the first application. Now, this is very early on, a collaboration with uh, Pierino Silvestrelli and Michele Parinello, uh, looking indeed at amorphous silicon and uh, pointing out, uh, and that was, I think, uh, very beautiful, it's not been exploited, uh, I think, uh, uh, as much as it could. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Vanier function, and in particular the Vanier function centers, uh, uh, could point uh, at a silicon atom that were uh, over-coordinated and under-coordinated in a way that geometry wouldn't tell you. You know, you might be a silicon atom uh, with uh, four silicon around you, according to a geometric criterion, but if you don't have a Vanier function center in between you and your neighbors, you don't really have a bond. So it might look that you are coordinated, uh, but you don't really have a bond. Michele studied it also for uh, liquid water. Here, Carla Molteni with Roman Martonak and Michele Parinello uh, studying silicon crust and under pressure. Uh, this was a very nice work by Stefan Goedeker uh, in which he looked at uh, uh, defects in silicon and uh, with their uh, sort of, you know, explorations, uh, the minima hopping method, uh, they found that this uh, uh, metastable state, uh, so locally stable, that they call the fourfold uh, coordinated defect in silicon. Uh, that's very beautiful because you see you have uh, this swap of the two red uh, silicon atoms, uh, but each of them now has a four Vanier function center exactly as if it was uh, in its original yellow equilibrium position. So from the electronic point of view, this state is invisible, but the formation energy of the state is much lower than the formation energy of any other native defect in silicon. This is two plus electron volts versus four plus electron volts. So your electronic devices are full of these defects, but uh, they have never been a sort of seen because they don't have an electronic or an optical uh, signature. So I don't know actually what's the state with this. And as I said, you know, Dominic King Smith and David Vanderbilt had established uh, that the berry phase polarization could also be written uh, as a sum of the Vanier centers. And if you want the, you know, Vanier function, the maximally localized Vanier function, 
uh, give you really a localized picture of uh, electrons. And so the Vanier center is the best that we have in a heuristic way as a representation of a localized electron with the additional theorem that uh, the sum of these uh, centers, this red center, uh, gives you actually the total uh, uh, polarization. So this is really a meaningful mapping of macroscopic dielectric properties into microscopic quantities. And indeed, David was very keen on ferroelectric. And so earlier on, we studied some of these classic ferroelectrics. Uh, here, one of the titanates, barium titanate. Uh, the top, uh, you see bands uh, occupied are this uh, uh, oxygen uh, 2p, these nine uh, bands, and uh, the 3d bands uh, from the titanium are uh, empty. And actually, there used to be a you know sort of polar picture of ferroelectrics uh, where uh, the titanium would give uh, uh, the you know the d, the 2d electrons, and the 2 4s electrons uh, to the uh, to the oxygen. But uh, in reality, when you actually look at the Vanier functions, uh, the picture is much less uh, polar. Uh, that is, uh, the Vanier function, you see the P Vanier function of the oxygen have this uh, uh, clearly 3D Z2 tails. Uh, and uh, as you move from the cubic to the ferroelectric, in this case, uh, the tetragonal phase, uh, and uh, you sort of you know, shorten one of the titanium oxygen bonds, uh, the upper one, you see you transfer a lot of charge from below to above. And so this gives rise to the very large and anomalous Born effective charges in this system. So this was you know, uh, the intuition that we could build for chemistry uh, with Vanier functions or for uh, um, dielectric properties. And uh, one of the next exciting step was saying, you know, let's try to construct Vanier functions that don't necessarily reproduce the occupied uh, manifold, that is the physical manifold. That's why we look at chemistry or dielectric properties. But let's try to, uh, you know, find the Vanier functions that reproduce a group of states of interest. And maybe because you want to do correlated electron studies, and so you want to sort of, you know, separate. Uh, uh, a certain uh, manifold, or maybe you want to build a uh, type binding Hamiltonian, or, you know, as will be a core, uh, you know, element in the school, uh, you want to do Vanier interpolations. And so we actually took, uh, you know, the case of uh, copper as a way to start uh, thinking, you know, if you have the band structure of copper on the left, uh, that's what you see. And the question was, uh, can we try to, you know, construct a maximally localized Vanier function that describe only the D states, uh, so that they describe uh, the manifold on the right. I mean, this is you know, impossible in general because uh, uh, especially at certain K points, uh, you see if I sit around here, uh, it's, uh, you know, the D bands are very mixed up uh, with the parabolic S band, while I uh, say at gamma, they would be very separated. So, you know, it's easy here, but is just uh, not uh, unique uh, here. And uh, what we did uh, was, uh, you know, saying again, you know, we need to find uh, an algorithm. We need to find a functional. We need to find a driving force to, you know, obtain uh, the transformation matrix that will give us uh, these uh, Vanier functions. And the concept that we introduced was that of um, optimal smoothness. That is, uh, we wanted to have, uh, in this case, a target manifold of dimension five, because we want the five Vanier functions of uh, you know, the 3D copper states. And uh, we are going to get them by asking what is uh, the smoothest manifold of dimension five across the entire Brian zone in an energy range that is uh, you know, uh, this few electron volts around uh, the, the Fermi surface. So this was the you know, geometric concept that we had in mind. Uh, how to do it uh, in practice uh, is, uh, again, fairly easy. That is, in order to make uh, things optimally smooth uh, as you span uh, the Brian zone, what you want uh, is that, uh, you know, that manifold of dimension five at every k-point uh, that comes from mixing 
you know, not five states, but mixing uh, six, seven, eight, uh, nine states uh, in the energy windows that you desire. So, you know, let's say we have nine states everywhere and uh, what we want, uh, we want to mix them uh, with a rectangular matrix uh, into five states uh, and these five states uh, needs to uh, be as smooth as possible. So we want to maximize the overlap uh, between, uh, uh, you know, this uh, five dimensional manifold S uh, at a certain K point uh, in all uh, and all its neighbors. So, so we had again, if you want uh, a procedure to go on and construct this. And, uh, you know, so we, you know, implemented this, this algorithm and we applied maybe let's do say copper first, you know. So what uh, we did that was uh, indeed uh, trying to find uh, the uh, manifold of optimal uh, smoothness of uh, this uh, red manifold uh, taking uh, states uh, in a certain energy window. And here it's sort of, you know, where uh, you could say you can make it, uh, say, uh, you know, smoother and smoother uh, the more states uh, you take. If you were to take, uh, you know, the infinite Hilbert space, uh, you would make it, uh, you know, absolutely flat. And so you have obtained uh, your optimal smoothness, but you have lost the physics. So you really want, uh, you know, to mix uh, the states uh, in a restricted energy window that you find it's uh, meaningful. And then uh, you see, you find uh, the red manifold that represents very well the D states uh, where the D states are very separated uh, from the S bands. Uh, but of course, uh, where they are mixed, uh, you know, these poor five states uh, that would need to represent a uh, manifold of dimension six, uh, they do their best in just uh, interpolating things. So, but one could extract, uh, let's say, you know, D and a function, or one could play around, uh, you know, we knew how to extract uh, this uh, covalent orbitals uh, from the four occupied states in silicon, but now we could take the uh, conduction band and try to extract uh, four from the bottom of the conduction band. And, uh, you know, what we were finding uh, was something like this here in gray, that is really an anti-bonding orbital between uh, the silicon atoms. Or we could try to mix uh, everything uh, together. And then instead of getting four covalent uh, Vanier functions and four anti-bonding Vanier function, uh, we would find uh, eight uh, sp3 hybrids uh, sitting uh, on, uh, on uh, um, you know, four on one atom and four on the other atom. So basically, you know, we had all the capabilities to do uh, whatever we want. We could do uh, something that, you know, was going to represent uh, as well as possible the, say, parabolic uh, S-bands of copper. We could play around uh, with the uh, we call them energy windows, deciding uh, which states uh, we would keep uh, frozen as they are and uh, which one we would, uh, we call it disentangle from the other states, like you would sort of extract a spaghetti from a jumble uh, using this, again, smoothness criterion and this uh, energy window. And uh, as I said, because all these algorithms uh, were not uh, relying uh, on the electronic such a code that we started with. Actually, at the time, I wasn't using Quantum Espresso. It was used a CASTEP or some uh, sort of extension of CASTEP that we did in Cambridge. It became a very natural earlier on uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, everything uh, became uh, uh, not uh, tied up uh, to a particular electronic such a representation. And so we had this uh, early work uh, with uh, Michel Posternak, Alfonso Baldereschi, and Sandro Messide. Very sadly, both Alfonso and Sandro passed away in the last uh, few years. Um, but uh, uh, we actually really, you know, thought at how to make uh, the Vanier code um, agnostic uh, of the electronic search code of choice uh, by formalizing what were the sort of, uh, you know, unshaking. These days you would call it probably a, the, the REST API with which the code was communicated, communicating with the other electronic such codes uh, just uh, through the matrix element MMN. Okay, in the last six minutes, I'll do two minutes each. Some of the you know, early applications and some of the later one uh, that were a lot of fun. Um, one I was really using uh, this maximally localized Vanier function uh, basically, I call it as, uh, you know, the Lego bricks uh, to construct uh, 
the electronic structure of nanostructures. And this is very, very closely related to this uh, concept of Vanier functions being uh, uh, excellent uh, interpolators. So we were working at the time on functionalized uh, carbon nanotubes. Uh, but basically, the idea was that, uh, you know, from the left side, uh, you could see you would have uh, uh, in your standard electronic structure formulation, the localized orbitals by going into this uh, localized uh, uh, orbitals representation, uh, you would really construct uh, sparse Hamiltonian matrices. Uh, and uh, we were interested, you see, in the electronic structure of functionalized nanotubes. And so we could, uh, you know, construct uh, locally the right sparse Hamiltonian matrix uh, in the presence of different uh, adducts and then putting uh, everything uh, together and uh, using uh, the sort of uh, language uh, of uh, transport uh, that people like Suprio Data and colleagues at Purdue had uh, developed, uh, or uh, say Mayer and Weingreen and the um, sort of uh, theory of recursive uh, Green's function by Lopez Sancho, or also by John Juanopoulos actually at MIT. Uh, one was able not only to sort of construct exactly like a Lego brick, uh, the Hamiltonian of the system, but also, you know, the Landauer conductance or the Green's function or the density uh, of states. And basically what uh, we realized in doing this uh, was indeed uh, these concepts uh, that uh, this uh, localized orbitals uh, were really the ab initio tight binding uh, basis uh, that could be used uh, to calculate and to interpolate a band structure very accurately. So if you want, uh, we went uh, from having uh, you know, are block states on a Monkost pack read uh, to having uh, Vanier functions. Uh, and the reverse transformation is constructing uh, the uh, block orbitals uh, from block sums. Uh, you see with these uh, phases now with a plus sign, K dot capital R. So we are taking the Vanier function, displacing phase factor, summing, displacing phase factor, summing, displacing phase factor. Uh, we never do this. Uh, in practice, but if we have to calculate, uh, you see the matrix element, uh, Psi Hamiltonian uh, Psi, and the Psi is a block sum, it's uh, obvious that uh, only the matrix elements are between uh, Vanier functions that are nearby, because they are exponentially decaying, uh, will, uh, will matter. And so if you had this Vanier function actually in a supercell uh, or on a coarse mesh, uh, you could uh, sort of diagonalize this Hamiltonian matrix uh, uh, very accurately. And we saw it here. Uh, we built, uh, uh, say, this uh, um, uh, Vanier basis uh, for uh, carbon nanotubes. Uh, and you see how perfect interpolators uh, they are to capture, in this case, uh, all these uh, states of the pi manifold around the Fermi energy, and only that, uh, and not the, say, parabolic states that are either, uh, say, uh, free electrons uh, or uh, anti-bonding combinations. Uh, maybe I won't go into the detail on how they work, uh, but, uh, you know, we realized that with these uh, recursion techniques uh, that you would, uh, you know, exactly capture, say, these discontinuities in the conductance of this Vanov singularity in the density of states, uh, uh, exactly even if you were at points that you hadn't sampled in this band structure. We are only sampling this point here and this point here, and so at where the vertical bars are, but we reproduce perfectly this uh, you know, top of the mini band there. And uh, you know, we use this uh, for uh, not only ballistic transport, but also in elastic transport phonons uh, in the self energies. And uh, let me conclude uh, with a couple of uh, topics that you'll see more in detail uh, uh, later on. Uh, one is what we did uh, with uh, Jun Feng Chao, and he'll present it on Saturday, and Giovanni Pizzi. Uh, that is, uh, we actually used a very simple concept of uh, projectability that had been introduced by uh, Luis Agapito, Andrea Ferretti, Marco Nardelli, and Stefano Curtarola, and others uh, in this context. Uh, uh, but basically, you see what uh, uh, we did uh, was uh, exploring here are a few material, graphene, silicon, copper and strontium vanadate, and we calculated the projectability on atomic orbitals. So in graphene, you see green is large projectability on the 2s, red is large projectability on the 2p, and thin black, uh, it means that those states have no projectability on localized atomic orbitals. 
same for silicon, copper, and strontium vanadate. So we came out with this uh, very simple but very effective uh, recipe, that is, uh, when uh, we construct a uh, maximally localized Vanier function by disentanglement first, uh, what we should do, basically, is uh, throw away from this uh, anything that looks like a thin a solid line. Uh, those states that have no projectabilities on atomic orbitals are not interesting to construct Vanier function. So once you throw away all of that, uh, your disentanglement becomes extremely robust and extremely automatic. And so this projectability disentanglement, where we throw away states that have very low projectability, uh, we cap as they are states that have very high projectability, and we throw everything, you know, what you saw basically as uh, colored uh, states uh, in the disentangled algorithm uh, works very well. And, uh, you know, Jun Feng has been... Uh, happily constructing millions of maximally localized Vanier function. This was when this paper came out, and now we have many more. But basically, uh, now finally, we have a, a very robust and reliable and automated recipe to construct, uh, say, atomic-like Vanier functions, the tight binding basis. And uh, once uh, we have this uh, you know, atomic-like basis, uh, we can also mix together these uh, states, uh, you know, maybe the eight uh, states in a silicon cell uh, to, you know, obtain uh, back the covalent uh, and the antibonding states. Uh, and we call that manifold remixing. And there are, again, very simple techniques uh, of uh, parallel transport and gauge uh, continuity uh, that uh, you, can, uh, you can use. And so these days, uh, we can basically take any arbitrary band structure construct uh, the atomic-like uh, tight binding basis, uh, and then uh, manifold remix uh, in states uh, that, uh, say, span maybe the occupied states, uh, or maybe they span uh, the empty states, uh, or maybe they span uh, just uh, one band of interest. So I think uh, we have a huge control on the construction of Vanier function, however we want. And uh, one of the nice applications, and then I'll conclude uh, well, two more minutes, uh, um, is uh, this uh, idea that we actually sort of came out uh, uh, around uh, 2000. I mean, it was you know, published in 2009, 2010, was earlier work uh, done together with Ismail Adabo and Matteo Cococcioni at MIT on uh, what we call Hopman's uh, functional with the idea, and that's actually very important, that we want to do functional theory is different from density functional theory. That is, as the name says, a functional theory of the density. Here we want to do functional of more complex quantities. Here is just functional of the orbital densities. In general, these days, we build even functional of the spectral density, the diagonal of the Green's function, to do not only ground state properties, but excited state properties. So what you would do with GW, or a correlated even electron properties as you do with dynamical mean field theory. But here may be the analogies with GW. So what we wanted, uh, we actually wanted to develop, a, a, if you want, a spectral functional that could describe a photoemission experiment. So you take a deep state, I think at this phi actually, maybe not as a connection state, but as a Dyson orbital, you're extracting an electron from your solid, and uh, was a original definition of uh, being a self-interaction free. But as you change the occupation of this orbital, you don't uh, want uh, this expectation value to change. So from this uh, single hypothesis uh, comes uh, all the practice of building uh, spectral functional that satisfy this, uh, the constants of the expectation value that translate into a piecewise linearity of the energy functional through Janak's theorem. And really what we are doing is removing orbital by orbital, the non-linear term that is typically quadratic-like, and we put back a term that is linear in occupation uh, with a slope eta that, uh, you know, in the simplest form is just uh, the value of the energy at a completely filled orbital, occupation one, uh, minus a completely empty orbital occupation zero. And if you do this and you use it as a functional, so you need to take into account uh, 
screening because as you extract the electron in the photoemission, you are going to have all the other electrons respond to it. So we have this orbital dependent screening coefficients. But once you do these things, uh, I think uh, your functionals scale appropriately to the thermodynamic limit. So they can describe not only, say, photoemission in molecules, but photoemission in solids because uh, the minimum, uh, the orbitals uh, at the minimum of the functional are localized. They look a lot like Vanier uh, functions. Uh, and so you can do, say, band gaps of solids. Uh, these are in green, uh, this uh, Koopman's functional, with uh, you know, an error on the band gap that starts to be comparable to you know, state of the art of you know, quasi particles have consistent GW uh, with vertex correction tends to be quite a bit better than single shot GW, but in particular is also much better in uh, representing the alignment of, uh, you know, the, in this case, the valence band edge, uh, you know, the ionization potential with respect to the vacuum level compared to single shot GW or quasi particle GW. I think uh, Antimo will show you many more uh, results uh, but uh, the results uh, in solids uh, with a gap, uh, we can only deal with system with a gap, uh, are actually quite uh, spectacular. Uh, and so I think a lot of the things that these days we are doing with GW in the future, we'll do it uh, with this Koopman's functional, including some of the electron phonon and the code is here and it's all released and open source. Okay, let me conclude. I mean, uh, I give you just a little bit uh, of a picture of uh, you know, the world of electronic structure for the case of Vanier functions. Uh, but uh, uh, two, three years ago, together with Andrea Ferretti and Chris Wolverton, we tried to really you know, create a, a you know, fairly brief uh, uh, article that was actually mapping the entire landscape of uh, ground state and uh, excited states uh, electronic structure methods for material simulation. So if you're interested in this field, I actually, I guess I'm, uh, in, not a very impartial, but I like this. So let me conclude with the acknowledgements. A sort of the photo are time stamped. So David, a sort of when we did this, Ivo, when we did it, Arash and Jonathan, when they joined uh, the group in uh, MIT, in my case, and of Ivo in Berkeley, and Giovanni Pizzi at EPFL that have been, you know, core to key uh, early development. I think Antimo will. Uh, describe uh, much more what has happened in the last uh, 10, 15 years. So here I just put the acknowledgement uh, to the people also involved uh, in the uh, transport uh, code calculations uh, and in the Koopman's uh, spectral functional. As you know, the code is all there, open source and apologies to be very long, sorry, Roxana, but uh, thanks a lot uh, for, uh, you know, staying up to here now. Then everybody can jump on follow after that and ask me questions. Yeah. So if you so the, the question was uh, do the Koopman's functional uh, use DFT or you either to redo everything? And in a nutshell, you do your DFT calculation of choice. Right now, they are interfaced with quantum espresso, so you converge to the ground state. And then uh, you do two more things. You need uh, to obtain uh, these uh, localized orbitals uh, for which uh, a very, very good approximation is Vanier function. So these days, we don't even bother we just uh, construct uh, from the DFT code uh, the Vanier functions, and then uh, we calculate, uh, and that's the only important thing, uh, these uh, screening coefficients that are basically the derivatives of the energy with respect uh, to a change in occupation in these Vanier functions, uh, and then uh, we just uh, evaluate uh, these, uh, these functionals. And it's all actually uh, embedded in uh, automated computational workflows uh, uh, with either ASC or uh, AIDA. So, uh, you know, these days, uh, and that's one of the theme of the workshop, uh, 
we try to, you know, basically encapsulate all this, you know, fairly boring and fairly sort of cumbersome steps into an automated workflow. But so the basics is uh, there is a quantum espresso calculation, a vanier calculation, and a post-processing calculation, like many other things, I think, uh, during the school. So that's a very interesting uh, question, and uh, uh, there is actually one element of this question that I never figured out, uh, uh, that is, uh, is the dynamics of the Vanier centers continuous? If you do a molecular dynamic simulation, uh, would uh, the you know, dynamics of the Vanier centers be continuous? My actually wild guess is that uh, if you look at the uh, centers uh, uh, of a particular manifold uh, where they are a linear combination of, a, you know, a covalent bond uh, is actually a linear combination of sp3 orbitals. Uh, and as these things move, uh, something weird uh, could happen uh, in which all of a sudden the Vanier centers jumps. Uh, if uh, we are looking at the Vanier centers that are not anymore physically meaningful, uh, but uh, uh, we are looking at the Vanier centers uh, of the tight binding Hamiltonian, I would imagine the non, you know, physical dynamics of that uh, to be very continuous. But you know, a, a simple example would be what happens during a metal insulator transition and what happens to the Vanier centers. So I don't know, uh, not many studies have been done and it would actually be quite interesting and uh, even not too difficult. So it could be an interesting research project. Okay, let's thank Nicola. Uh, the lunch is going to be in the same place where we had the breakfast in the morning, yeah, in the same building. So it's not going to be here. Yeah, okay, so I don't know, can, can I, yeah, so we are finishing the session for Zoom and we will reconvene uh, tomorrow, we will try to answer the final question and then we will uh, close the Zoom, uh, thank you very much.